Thanks to our other speakers. And I hope from there you can see how. Gonzalez and Brian Desai, the voices of the Philippine animation. Uh, good morning. How are you? Are you already full or full? <laughs> so anyway, uh, of course we're going to discuss about the art of voice acting in animation. So can you imagine an animation without a sound or a music or a voiceover? It's a silent movie. <laughs> it was like 1930s, right? So, uh, why is voice acting very important in animation? And also in computer games? Who are gamers here? Yeah, hacker slash. <laughs> so, well, I'm proud to say I'm also, I'm also a gamer. I uh, play computer games for like four hours a day. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm also proud to say that I'm part of uh, one of the first uh, Filipino full-length Disney animation style in the Philippines, which is to, to be patrolled by our very own uh, Grace Di Maranon of Top Fake Animation. And uh, <clears throat> well, our company, Creative Voices, is the very first voiceover uh, company that is selling voices online. So right now, we have done thousands of uh, projects like co uh, TV and radio commercials, Japanese anime, original content animation, computer games, podcasting, etc. And right now, our company, Creative Voices Productions, is podcasting all the candidates for this election for Inquire.net. So you can visit www.inquire.net and you can listen to them, uh, to their platform and other projects for, for the Filipino. So, you will hear them online. So, without further ado, uh, we got my partner Brian, Brian Matthew Lixai, one of the best DJ and voice talent in the country, will talk about the art of voice acting. Okay, Brian? Online, the turnaround is very fast. Within 72 hours, you will have the finished product. Our transactions are usually back to back or through money order because we don't have any um, PayPal accounts here in the Philippines unless, of course, uh, pretty soon no, it comes out. So we usually do it the old-fashioned way still, through bank orders and or to money orders and bank to bank. So we do audio design, voice down production, character and animation production. We also do concepts and consultation for hardware setups. If you want to have your own studios, we also do that for, of course, audio and sound. Now, Today we'll be talking about a brief history of the voice acting industry in general. Trends and development. Uh, we got the power of the voice actor and what it can do for you, for your animation. Uh, the voiceover market share in animation. Systematic casting for animation and of course the manic voice, the real mind. And like all of us here who are fond of cartoons, it is finding the kid in you. All right. Starting off with a brief history, or with a voice or rather, definitely is uh, unseen, all right? A voiceover is a performance of one or two or more unseen voices for uh, communicating, communicating a message. From uh, the word voice over picture, it is the word or the words behind a picture for television or for uh, movies. And Elaine Clark also, adds that there are the voices uh, behind CD-ROM video games, interactive televisions, audiobooks, IVRs, ADRs, and the sort. Okay, so voiceovers are all, all, all around us, you know. You can hear them if you're at the MRT station, you can hear them there, if you go to shopping malls, the ones speaking on, on, on the uh, intercom, it's everywhere, all right? It's, uh, it's a very big and booming business in the United States. We consider it here in the Philippines as a very uh, young market because there hasn't been uh, many representations of uh, voiceovers here in the Philippines. In fact, we are the only voiceover company here in the Philippines to start off with the voice acting industry and representing voiceovers abroad. Uh, there are factions, there are groups, there are uh, certain people out there that, that uh, work for companies, but still. They are individuals and uh, producers alike for maybe an audio production, but not for a voiceover. 
um, voiceover company. Now, to tell you more about the history of the, the voiceover industry, the um, technology, or the, the voices rather that we use, are very much inclined to towards technology. Way back in the 1930s and the 1940s, when the first creation of the diaphragm mic was, was made, uh, they can only hear certain low key voices. All right, so in, during that time, you can hear guys talking in very big voices because it's essential. It's the only voice that can be picked up by the mic. Now, during the 1970s towards the 1980s, from the male part of the group, it began to uh, the female, uh, the female uh, uh, voiceover talents came in because of the construction of new and better mics, and that uh, the consumers in the 1980s are looking for more, uh, you could call it a more personal touch to the delivery of uh, a product or a service. As we may say, uh, a man's voice is very authoritative. A female's voice for a voiceover is more convincing. So uh, it depends on your product, of course, if you have a shampoo product. You can't have a guy promoting your shampoo because, you know, it's time to be here. Unless, of course, the guy has a very long hair. Okay. Now, moving on with our presentation, we've got the following trends and developments in the voiceover industry. Before, there, it's dominated actually by the male voiceover talent. All right, about 90, 95% of all performances way back in the 1970s and the 1980s are dominated by men, and in the mid-1980s to the 90s, then the female came in. All right, there are new and better opportunities for voiceovers here and abroad because of online applications, website intros, and games like that. Screen actors are taking interest in the voiceover industry because the payout is much, much higher, uh, and uh, the rewards are better because if you're a, an actor for a stage or for example on the screen you'll have to have you'll have to spend a lot of time fixing yourself up you know you have to spend a lot of time memorizing the lines and rehearsals and stuff like that but if you are a good voice actor and a, an actor at the same time like Robin Williams he started out as a voice actor before he became an actor uh, it's very easy for you to perform behind the mic it will only take you about 15 minutes inside the studio, and you can earn as much as five times the wage of a manager in a, a regular uh, day's work. And a uh, representation, if you have an agent in the United States, they would consider you as a low-key performer if you don't have any representation. And in the United States, they usually have... We start off, of course, with the project. You, you, you tell us about your project, we talk about the... Uh... Congrats. Tell good luck. Congratulations for Robert. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you don't mind that the media are here? No, actually what, yeah. what will happen is uh, GMA7 and ABC5 will ask their questions first. Mm -hmm. They don't need a, I need they it don't to need a few You seem to know what you're doing. I'll just follow. Okay. A nice note of someone who... Knows what he's doing. And <laughs> okay, so we'll have the we'll have Jamie seven go first. Say yeah. Mark. Actually, short sure, length one. Sound bad lang for para sa sarili na nito. Say yeah. We'll shift your. Okay. Mo kung mga high tech niyo alam yan. Oh nga. At tagalip tayo. Ma'am, we observe na parang ang bagong uso na ngayon sa kampanya, high-tech, yung long with the conventional na uh, you go to the passive to sulukang barangay ng mga, ng mga probinsya to campaign. Ganun na rin ba yung in-employ in sa sarili ng campaign? Ang ginagawa ko, Mark, pareho. Dahil ang gusto pa rin ng Pilipino, nakahaplos, natitignan, nakahawakan. Nung isang araw sa Rizal, nag-side trip ako, pumunta ako, naliwala ko, hindi, sa barangay Hanosa East Kapanin. Sabi ni Ronald, habang nag-motorcade lahat sa buong Rizal, nakaabot din ako. Got like 15 minute, 20 minute boat ride pa ako sa isla at wala ko rin makakarating na sinagurdum. Doon ako rin so, enjoy ako sa mga barangay. Pero, enjoy din ako sa high tech. At first time ko ngayon dito, um, um, podcasting. <laughs> so, it's my children, my sons who know about these things. Um, I'm from the old school but I'm willing to learn today. <laughs> so, I would employ both. Pero sa tingin niyo, ano mas importante ngayon? Media warfare o itong pag-iikot pa rin? 
yung media at yung sakop ng telebisyon, ng internet, ng radyo, ng lahat ng forma ng komunikasyon ay napakalagat. At hindi ba natin kaya ikutin ang 80 provinces, 1,600 cities and municipalities or 240,000 uh, precincts no? all over. So talagang ang media ay mahalaga. Pero hindi na maaring hindi ka nakikita, naririnig ka lang, nakikita ng telebisyon kung Um, because um, they, they want, as I said, they want to feel and, and see the candidate. So, it will take a combination of pag-iikot, ng hand-to-hand, uh, uh, handshakes, and house-to-house, even para local na kampanya, at the same time, reach as many people as possible. Hindi lang yung mga Pilipino sa bansa, kundi na yung overseas Filipinos to uh, programs like this. Sa, kam- sa kampanya niyo po, anong mas ginagasta sa inyo? Yung sa media, katulad nitong lahat na to, o yung, yung soybeans? Nako, Mark. Ang pinakamahalang media. Mahal ba ng airtime niyo eh? <laughs> Kaysa sa soybeans. Napakamahal naman. Paano na kami? <laughs> Napakamahal ng airtime. Yun ang aray talaga. Noong 1998, noong una akong tumakbo, ay may ad ban pa nun. Kaya nun, ang gastos, halos wala. Postering. Ang aeroplano naman sa ng partido, siguro yung headquarters lang, kuryente, at uh, paggawa ng sample balance, pero partido na rin yun. Kaya walang gastos. Ito, 80% ng gastos ay airtime. I mean, hindi airtime sa news. I'm talking about airtime ng political advertisements. Siyempre, kayong mga malaking station, napakamahal. <laughs> yun ang talagang masakit sa bulsa. So ano pong alternative niyo na high-tech campaigning din maliban sa airtime ng television? Well, ito nga through the internet, through the um, uh, what we're doing now. Um, I will launch my, my relaunch my website in the next few days also. Text, text, yeah. text brigade. A text brigade, yes. Oh, ginawa rin naman sa 2004. Nung ano, uh, Valentine's Day, nag-text ako. Ako wala akong anong way, cellphone, baka hindi kita na-text. <laughs> Pero yun, texting, then, then internet, and of course, um, other forms of communications. Then, pero ayon sa Pulse Asia, 80%, is it accurate? Still get their information from television. Ang posters nga daw, 3% na lang. Kaya hindi na ako masyadong gumagasa sa posters. Ang mamahal ko. Campaigning has become so expensive. Parang hindi na, na magiging patas sa mga mayayaman na kandidato at sa mga gaya namin. Ano lang, simple lang. Masyadong magastos na. Pero buti na lang may cap on the number of minutes sa television at sa radyo. But even then, kung i-maximize mo yung gamit mo, napakamahal pa rin. Kaya ako'y natutuwa na pwede kang through the internet no, mag-communicate ng iyong uh, mensahe. At siguro mas ano pa, mas uh, malawak pa dahil yung 30 seconds sa TV, 30 seconds sa radyo, ano masasabi mo, di ba? Marami dyan, sumasayaw lang. <laughs> Pero dito, sa ating ginagawa ngayon ay maaring 30 minutes, one hour, it can be edited according to them, at maaaring pa ulit-ulit, at marami rin at reach. At libre. At libre. Libre ba? Yes. Thank you. Ay, salamat. <laughs> Akala ko sisigilin ako eh. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'll just, it's iPod. What do you call it? It's podcast. Podcast. It's not iPod. Podcasting. That's what you call the... Yeah, it's derived from the iPods. iPod. It is iPod. You broadcast an iPod. Siguro I should say podcasting. I should... Yeah. Uh, yeah, so gratis. Yeah. Okay. Ulitin ko lang yun ako. So, Mark, maraming mga um, pamamaraan para marating ang iyong mga constituents sa mga putante. Pero maganda tong podcasting na atin gagawin ngayong araw na ito para mas marating ang maraming mga uh, nakikinig at mga manunood or, or constituents for that matter sa mas mga malawak na mga issues, hindi lamang 30 second or ad. It can be a one hour thing, can be re-edited at mababalik at balik at nila. At libre. <laughs> So it's just like putting this interview we have now on the inquirer.net website exactly. and people can access it mm-hmm. and listen to it instead of just reading it. Yes. Okay. And the good thing about it is the formula that JP was talking about is not just here in the Philippines, it's all, all over the yeah. world. Mm-hmm. Even overseas. Philippines. How do you survey the four minute? How do you know it's four minute? I mean, if our servers mean, record every every time you go to our website, website. our servers ah, record. Ano yeah. Oh, because it's not the same. Yeah, very things and you know your viewership. Ito, this one, yeah, because every time the server serves a page, it's recorded. 
It's called a page view. What's your uh, maximum potential market for this? If it's only four million now, you mean everyone who has a computer around the world can potential. actually access it? Potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about mostly, of course, overseas Filipinos and Filipinos. Yeah. So we do have percentages of uh, who access from where. What's the demographics of this four million? How much are overseas workers? Majority. How uh, majority of the four million are overseas? Mm -hmm. Approximately twenty-seven percent of the Philippines. The rest is. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, candidates can advertise their messages. Through this is the most cost effective way, actually, to advertise messages overseas. Remember, they can vote. And it's not uh, limited to 30 seconds, of course. No, it's not. So they generally say that, you know, I mean, it's uh, a very long podcast. Yeah. You know, people might get, I mean, you can have a very long podcast, people might tune out 20 or 30 minutes into it, but nonetheless, the potential is there. Mm -hmm. You know, they can oh, listen to the whole thing if they want. And I can do this from my home. Yes. Every day. Sister, huh? Okay, but high tech time. There's so many people with home spun radio shows that are available yeah. in yeah. podcasts. Yeah. Okay. The best would be a company. But we don't normally, uh, you know, we take the whole thing, you know, basically. We don't produce it into sound bites. In fact, our tag for this thing is no sound bites, just press answers to pressing questions that you wanted to ask. So take a slide. Take a slide. Yeah. No editing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, that, they almost said us. I'll do the speed again just to be safe. Let's first. It'll be first. Well, thank you, JV, and it's a um, unique experience to be here today to do this uh, program with you. Okay. Our first question will be from Lynette Luna, a great new setting. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lynette. After the turmoil of the 2004 elections, what made you decide to get back into the political arena, especially since your protest before the presidential electoral tribunal is still ending? Well, I must admit that it was traumatic, 2004, I mean, um, having been robbed of your victory after having campaigned for three and a half months and spending quite a sum. Uh, when we were campaigning, you are almost sure we were going to win because of the overwhelming support shown by the people in every part of the country, even in areas where we didn't have political leaders. But um, the rest is history, you know what happened. We did not have the machinery to protect our votes. We were not the brocade candidates. But on July 23, 2004, I filed my vice presidential electoral protest. And since then, it has been moving, but very slowly. And it has cost me, just for one province alone, in Lano del Sur, 12 million pesos. After having lost in quotation marks, or not having to make a claim, and spending a huge sum of money, shelling out 12 million, is a very, very difficult thing to do. But I did so because my three-year fight for truth, fairness, and justice on the 204 elections, for me, is a principled fight. It is a fight of conviction. From the beginning, my friends and supporters said, forget it. They will not make you sit as vice president. Forget your fight. I could not do it with it because I had to pursue it to see what really happened. For me to be at peace with myself and to know what transpired in 2004. And true enough, I saw it with my own eyes. And no less than Attorney Makalintal, the lawyer's uh, the opponent, uh, opponent's lawyer, and Chairman Avalos of the Comelec, and the printer of the Comelec had admitted that the election returns in Congress of certain municipalities in the province of Lano del Sur were actually substituted with fake or forged um, election returns. So what have I proven after three years, after 12 million pesos down the drain, after finishing 
just one province in a protest. I have proven just through my pilot province of Lanao Sur that indeed there was fraud in 2004 as proven in the election returns that were substituted and faked and no less than the opponent had admitted that. And it is it was admitted in open court, it is in the history of the Supreme Court in the vice presidential electoral protest. With that alone, I believe I have won a moral victory. True, I may not sit as vice president. I never ever thought I would because my resources are limited and time is also limited and real politics, impossible. Why would they make you sit? But it was important for me to be able to wage the principled battle and to prove the fraud of 2004. Now, am I scared now? Yes. I'm traumatized. I'm scared that it could happen. And scared all the more because we don't have the machinery, even the resources, the money, to protect 240,000 precincts over the country. You will need 2 billion pesos. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't have that. If we did not have it in a presidential campaign, how could we have it on a senatorial level? But then again, there's a number of the PPCRV, the media, the civic groups, our local leaders who hopefully this time will not allow it to happen. But if it happens and we are cheated of victory in May of 07, that's a very scary scenario because it would mean the crumbling <coughs> of our democratic processes. If, again, the results in May are subverted and the true votes and the true voice of the people are not adhered to, then I fear the future of this country. Um, I'm number one in all surveys. I say that not to be modest, but as a matter of fact. <coughs> Yvonne Falls Asia SWS. They all say I'm a runaway winner. But why am I working so hard? Why am I campaigning like it was my first time? Because it has to be so overwhelming that even if they cheat me, they can't rob me of victory. Why? Because I'm obsessed with victory? No, because I just have to prove the point that first to be able to serve, you have to win. And that you can win without using guns, goons, and gold just by reaching out to your constituents through media such as this that we're doing. Thank you very much. What can you say to criticisms that after fighting for the impeachment of the post president Joseph Estrada, you are now running under the opposition picket, which he has endorsed? Very good question. Let me clarify. In 2001, yeah. I was a senator for his impeachment because impeachment happens in the House of Representatives. Impeachment emanates from the House. It was um, it was Senator Villar, Senator, no, it was yeah, Senator Villar, then House Speaker, who banged the gavel and who impeached. President Era. I did not impeach him. It was a congressman in the lower house. What we did in the Senate was to hear uh, the case of the impeached president so that we would either vote for or against his conviction. As we all know, the prosecutors walked out, there was Encelos, and there was no conviction of the former president. I performed my role as a senator judge. I studied well, being a non-lawyer, I believe that my role in the impeachment was crucial because I was able to bring up the truth, at least part of it, in 2001. But then again, when we look back now, okay, many of us were part of Encelos, but where are everybody now? Um, everybody have left the administration and have gone to the opposition. Why? Because we are opposed to corruption. We are opposed to government, overspending in government, uh, of government funds. We're opposed to to um, things that are happening in government which is not aligned with what we believed in in 2001. So I am definitely not uncomfortable that I am running with a party endorsed by former President Estrada because I have performed my role as a senator judge in partial, as I would want to call it, in 2001. And when things didn't go right, we added with the administration we helped install it to office and if they um, did not prove themselves worthy of the mandate of the people then i believe it was just right of us to move over and to fight against what they're doing as you said uh, you were number one in practically all the surveys so if elected or when elected how will you define your term this time in the senate and basically yes. what bills will be pushing 
Okay, I wish I could enumerate all my bills and laws which I've offered, hundreds of them, and more than dozens of them um, enacted into law. But I will mention some, um, specifically for the women who are um, listening to us right now. I'm the co-author and um, author and sponsor of the um, Anti-Domestic Violence Act. It is very important for those who are listening to us abroad because many of our innocent and um, innocent um, kababayans in the Visayas in Mindanao are lured to go abroad and they are trafficked, used as sex slaves, uh, forced into bondage, into forced labor because uh, they, they don't know any better, because they're in dire need of financial um, upliftment. And the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act which I co-authored and pushed as majority leader, had been enacted into law. And this was, in fact, even lauded by the U.S. government because trafficking is a syndicate even bigger than drug trafficking. And, and that's a trafficking in persons, a human trafficking. And that's very, very important that we have the law enacted. Second, the Anti-Domestic Violence Act. Um, spousal abuse had been a problem in this country. Um, many of our... Uh, women had suffered in silence for decades, either because of economic abuse, physical abuse, or even psychological or mental or emotional abuse. Before, when they would complain to the police or to the uh, barangay captain who could knock at their door, they would say, ay, away mag-asawa lang yan. But now, the women have ammunition, and it had to take a woman majority leader, if I would say so myself, to be able to push this important measure. And when I see women crying on TV, case studies, um, or women have come to me and tell me, we're using your law that you have authored to defend us against abusive live-in partners, boyfriends, or spouses, then I feel good that somehow I've helped uplift the state of our women in our country. It's just two of the pro-women bills that have become laws. Um, one other important uh, law which I authored, which is very important to our Muslim population because we were the only country in Asia with a Muslim population that did not regard the end of Ramadan as a um, national holiday. And therefore, Idil Fitir is now a holiday. And whenever it is Idil Fitir, I get texts from Lower Wind and I say, uh, Inshallah, Mom, because of you, um, Idil Fitir is now a holiday. In fact, my bill had twin holidays. It should have had Idil Adha. It was blocked by the Senate then, but I intend to make it a national holiday too. You might think, we Christians might think, oh, what's that? It's just a holiday. But to them, regarding it as a holy day is so important to them. And no less, the Saudi ambassador, the Blu-ray ambassador, have congratulated me for what I did in 2001. Another very important uh, law, which I principally authored and, um, and sponsored, was the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law. Yung paghihiwalay ng basura. The segregation of garbage at source, recycling, and composting. That's very important for any industrializing third world nation because there's money in garbage. If this uh, policy is implemented in middle class barangays like in Barangay Blue Ridge and in areas in Navotas and Bulacan and in Barangay Forbes Park, which is upscale, why can't it be done around the country? And therefore, six years ago in 2001, the first law signed by them newly uh, installed President GMA into office was my law, the Solid Waste Management Law, uh, which has been again lauded by environmental groups. And I did not do it alone. I did this with the support of people like Dr. Pai Pai of the University of the Philippines, of Odette Alcantara, Marta Camacho, Mother Earth Foundation, who all, all helped me craft this law. Another very important law which I offered, which should be implemented, is a tropical fabric law. Again, it may not hit the headlines of the news in television and print, but it's a very important law because it mandates that each government employee must wear um, natural or indigenous fiber, meaning piña, Philippine cotton, uh, abaca, etc. Why is it important? Because it does not only bring back pride in culture and heritage, but it also gives livelihood to people in the grassroots. Dahil pag magtarin ka ng abaca, ng piña, ng banana, you know, uh, immediately you would have a, a marketing outlet for all of these products because there would be a demand for these kinds of fibers which come from our native grown products. Um, I can read to you many of the other measures which I authored. Um, the 
clean air act of 1999. But why do we still have smoke belchers in our uh, highways? Maybe it's the LTO, calling on the LTO, help somebody does something about it. In our motorcades, I have a slight cough now because I go out of my vehicle, I'm able to sniff all the dirty, polluted air of Metro Manila because the law which I have authored with Selva Monasan in 1999 is not being effectively implemented. And that's a clear act. And it specifically mandates that the LTO, upon registration of all vehicles, must check the emission testing of, of all these vehicles and must not register them. But why is it that there are many mobile sources of pollution, buses, jeeps, tricycles, which um, get uh, registered but do not abide by the laws of the Clean Air Act? Again, another very important law which I offered with the late Senator Oplet is a PESO bill, Public Employment Service Office. Why is it import important? The biggest problem of our country Millions of our countrymen are unemployed. This law mandates that each mayor must appoint a PESO officer, a public employment service officer, to match the needs of the place, the town, or the city with the talents of his constituents. Now, the anti money laundering act, we were taken out of the blacklist no? from the international organizations because of our adherence to the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which I helped push as majority leader and which I co-authored as well. Again, we made uh, very stricter, stringent measures in terms of uh, our drug abuse program through the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act, which I helped author with the late Senator uh, Robert Barbers. Again, livelihood is so important. I saw to it that the Barangay is empowered. The Barangay Business Enterprises Act looks at the need of the Barangay and mandates, again, the banks like the Land Bank or the BBP, the Development Bank of the Philippines, provides capital, magpapa utang sa barangay, so that they're given enough capital for their own livelihood. If you're not yet contented with all my bills, I can tell you more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the um, the seventy percent of your listeners in the podcasting, I understand, of overseas are overseas Filipinos, and our gift to them was a dual citizenship act which, of course, was pushed by then Senate President Frank Pindrilon and the Overseas Absentee Voting Act. Unfortunately, in 2004, not many people yet knew about this or there was difficulty in its implementation. But hopefully now, through mailing, voting by mail, through information dissemination of the consulates and the embassies, more people can, overseas Filipinos can go to the respective embassies and, um, and vote. And I'd like to uh, mentioned that I was part uh, of the team that crafted this law. We even went to New York and did um, consultation with our overseas Kababayans there. Um, of course, I mentioned the, the uh, Citizenship Retention and Reacquisition Act, and this allows all natural born Filipinos to reacquire uh, their Philippine citizenship. You know, many of the Filipinos who go abroad, they may be US citizens, even again British citizens, etc. But their heart still belongs to the Philippines. They want to come back. They want to have a stake in the um, running of the affairs of state. They want to come back and retire here. And with this um, Citizenship Detention and Reacquisition Act, they're able to do this and even able to own property. I can even tell you other measures which I did, uh, which are now Republic Acts. For the people of Batanes, maybe those listening to us have read this in Batanes, I made Batanes a protected area. The Ibatanes are a beautiful people. Batanes, I think, is, is um, we're very proud of the culture of the Ibatanes, and that must be protected. Um, the Early Childhood Care and Development Act is principally sponsored by Senator Oreta. You know, I have to give credit where credit is due, but as majority leader, I um, I pushed this, and I also co-authored this measure with her. For the people from Pangasinan who are listening, I co-authored um, the city, the charter of the city of Alaminos, Pangasinan. I hope, and I'll be going there uh, this week. I hope the people of Alaminos remember this. In fact, um, they have made me an adopted daughter of the city of Pangasinan. The people of Muntinlupa, I was just there the other day. No wonder they received me so warmly. I'm also the author of the Muntinlupa City Charter Day. And the Negros State College of Agriculture. The creation of this college is so important because as we know, Panay in Region 6, specifically Negros, is an agricultural area. And we know that the sugar planters need all the support. And therefore, we were part of um, 
of the creation of this um, Republic Act 9141. The latest state university we also had helped um, in RA 9158. Uh, the Film Development Council, the new Philippine Nursing Act, which helps on nurses and gives them more benefits. I also co-authored and co-sponsored that measure. And uh, we also had some additional privileges for Balik clients who are coming home by allowing them a bigger um, allowance for purchases from the duty free allocation uh, to, the, to them. And in fact, um, the Cebu International School, um, giving them the authority to run as an international school, I also authored that, I think, yes, I principally authored that measure. And something very important is a Magna Carta for the working child. There have been many um, child miners, child laborers in factories who have been abused and deprived of their rights. But because it is Magna Carta for the working child, the rights are protected in line with the United Nations requirements uh, for the protection of the child. You want some more? Thank okay. you very much. I think uh, we are more than enlightened. About yes. The, uh, Thank you. And I will do more. Yes. You know, I did this only in six years. And this is only legislation, Lynette. I did not limit myself to the four walls of the Senate. What I did was enact bills into laws which are needed by various sectors. As you can see, it's multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional for the environment, for women, from Pangasinan to Cebu to Leyte, for the overseas Filipinos, for the Muslim Filipinos. Apart from that, what I did was also focus on projects because I'm a very impatient person. I want results to be done yesterday. And I realized that sometimes legislation takes quite a while. So what I did was I embarked on programs that did not require legislation. That is the reason why I have a scholarship program under my Libro Milore Foundation, which started with a former child minor, Sinuha Batang Minero, from Paracale, Camarines Norte. I've graduated 20 child minors, and it has expanded now to include Aitas of Zambales with the Rotary Club of uh, Makati, as well as um, 24 children from Barangay Batulao with the Don Bosco Brothers in um, Nasubu, Batangas. So that's under the Libro de Lauren Foundation. At sa awan naman ng nakaraos ako, even if for the past three years I was out of office and my resources were scraping bottom with my electoral protest, I was able, through the help of friends, to con able to continue the scholarship of his children and they did not stop schooling. Apart from that, we have the Lumpi and Filipinas where we plant trees in every conce conceivable place. In a span of eight years, we were able to plant eight million trees. And you can see some of that in the North and South Expressway. In every exit you see in the South, for example, in Mount Plaza across Brent School, the big acacia trees there were planted in 1998. If you will recall, in 97, 98, these were all empty areas full of garbage. What we did with no government resources underlying, no government resources, through my initiative and the help of friends and sponsors and donors, we were able to plant trees and um, make them grow. Unfortunately, Millennial had had uh, uprooted half at least of his trees in the South Expressway, but we're continuing to replant now. Thank you very much, Lauren. Good luck in your campaign. This time, I'd like to go back to basics. Why is it that despite the laws we've enacted, people are still poor? Why are millions of Filipino families living on 32 pesos a day? Why are we importing rice? Why are we importing toyo and patis? Definitely, there's a need to improve food production. There's a need to enact laws that will put food on the table for millions of Filipino families. So my focus this time is to um, put food on the table. Poverty alleviation focusing on eradicating or eliminating or even reducing hunger training programs. And third, there's a need for a comprehensive healthcare agenda. In every place I visit around the country, um, people always come to me and they need money to buy medicine or uh, local officials asking for this kind of equipment for public hospitals. There's definitely a um, While it's difficult for call center workers you know, because of the 24-hour schedule and it has changed lifestyles, still it's an addition to the workforce. And uh, they, it, it, it's also important that we have it here because we're proficient in English, we're disciplined lot um, as long as there's a system to it. While the entrepreneurship is important, I think I spent around from 70 to 80 million pesos, which are all donated amounts. And this included um, the political ads as well. For this year, 
for this year oh i don't have a projection yet because i'm still fundraising <laughs> but um it can't be it, it would be similar i guess to the vice presidential but maybe less because there are many people campaigning now so a lot of people are fundraising so for those listening and overseas Filipinos would want to donate. Is it illegal to do this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they're welcome <laughs> to donate. It's really very expensive. And that's what I dislike most about politics. The overspending and the tiresome campaigning. And uh, the promise here, promise that, promise that. I, I just want to do the work. As you can see, I'm just a worker. I just want to create laws. I just want to legislate um for different sectors but what i don't like is the overspending because for me, i'll say what i said before it's truly unfortunate it's a tragedy for both parties and i even went to the wake of the family uh and, and condoled with the family who are my good friends it's really a tragedy and i hope and i pray that justice will be served along uh with poverty comes uh school buildings the hiring of tens of thousands of teachers and the retraining of these teachers that would entail resources and therefore we need to focus on that and it is mandated in the constitution that education must get the priority in our uh, budget allocation environmental laws are violated how our rich resources are being depleted by um by the lack of awareness of environmental measures existing or simply our apathy as a people so environmental uh, concerns are very important. It is a gut issue. If you've seen inconvenient truth, it will happen in every part of the world. So you think um, what is more important is national solidarity over our, for this type of migration, something you would encourage? And what type of legislation would you um, propose to respond to this problem? We can look at it both ways. We can look at it as a problem because it causes some uh, some issues in terms of uh, family and the social uh, aspect of it all but it can also be perceived uh, or looked at as a blessing because they bring in 12 billion a year on the goal it is worth the money and therefore i think the close monitoring of the common is important and we should maybe limit, maybe the capital spending, maybe limit the airtime. I'm not saying to put back the political ad band because the media will get mad at me. And uh, I came from media myself, but really to limit the airtime and to subsidize maybe the cost of airtime. Because right now it's 30% of the rate card, which is still very expensive. 200,000 pesos for a 30 second commercial. That's a hefty sum. And um, what happens is the candidates who have the resources, the billionaires, are the ones who are seen often in TV. But somehow, the viewers, but we must also study them um, completely exhaustively. I'm a uh, Catholic, and I am totally against any form of abortion. But I think that... Uh, I have slash gaming site. I don't know if you play games, but we will ask you later. No, my son does. I'm sorry, I don't play video games, but he does. And that's my problem. He plays too much games that he, um, he stays up very late or early in the morning because he plays games and chats and he's such a computer whiz. But at least you get to bond over games, over video games. Uh, does he teach you some of the games? I wish them? I could, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know if it's right to say this. It has been a hindrance <laughs> to bonding because sometimes when the children play games, uh, it's noisy. I can't answer it because I haven't listened okay. to the radio or watched television. I have not even seen my television commercial on TV. I only approved it after it was produced. And I'll tell it to... Yeah. yeah. Well, let's yeah. Let's yeah. Let's yeah. Ah, okay. Let's yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, tika, yeah. Friends to ajay sa blog, 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 blog. Yung blog. Ay, si oh, yeah. may blog, may blog sila. Ayun. Yung mag-blog tayo. Ito yan. Teka, yan yung blog yung website mo. Okay, na, okay. Then invite so you need to do can you ano, email a complaint to Yahoo? Find out. That's how it is using Lauren Legard at Yahoo.com. That's not me. Ito mag issue ng person is araw-araw yan. Naminumura ang taong ba yan. That's why you're Yahoo. When we get stuff on email, we always call up for Yahoo. Ako, her Yahoo address is LB Legard at Yahoo.com. Hindi, LB. Lauren B. LB na, iba na? Kasi may reject nga yung Lauren Legard. No, that you can talk to the server squad. You can talk to it. There's an arbitration board coming. Ay, ako, problema. Yeah, because he just had a bypass. He just like Chavit in Anjab. No, I'll make a Chavit. Anjab last year or something. Or some operation. Good evening, Congressman. Good evening, Jenny. You know, the Philippines has been chowing along economically, not really soaring some of its Asian neighbors. What do you think are the three most important problems keeping the Philippines from feeding all its people, sending all its kids to school, and giving them all the basic needs for a decent life? Hmm. First, insofar as um, being able to attract enough business to be able to provide enough jobs for people to earn enough to pay for whatever basic needs they might um, want to have, including education, food, clothing, and housing. The number one problem so far as that is concerned is um, power cost. Um, electricity simply costs, um, the cost of electricity is simply too high in our country in order to attract enough investments to be able to provide jobs for our citizens and perhaps enable them to buy whatever it is they want and to educate their own children. Um, all of the surveys conducted, um, either here or abroad, would point to the cost of power as the number one culprit. It's not even instability. It's not even um, the unions that we have here. It's not even the strikes that usually occur. It is power, and that is what we should resolve it so far as self attracting businesses is concerned. Secondly, so far as the economy is concerned, spending on social services, including education and health. It's a, it's a question of budgetary prioritization and allocation. Um, under the Constitution, highest budgetary priority must go and must be given to education. However, they have included some items which we call off-budget items to the budget. For example, the internal revenue allotment. And secondly, debt servicing. These two big-ticket items actually have a bigger allocation in our budget than education. And they were able to circumvent that particular quantity provision by simply saying these are off-budget items, automatically appropriated, and did not pass through but the budgetary process um, in Congress, both in the House and in the Senate. Third, perhaps, um, insofar as that particular issue of problem is concerned, would be corruption. Um, 
the Philippines right now is um, ranked as one of the highest, not only in Southeast Asia, not only in East Asia, but also in the world, so far as the corruption index is concerned. Um, Transparency International medications have been um, logging or ranking the Philippines at an increasing rate compared to other countries which have improved in so far as their medal against corruption is, is um, concerned. For example, according to the recent data of the Department of Finance, we are losing approximately 200 billion pesos via corruption in so far as the capital of the government is concerned. Approximately 70 billion pesos in so far as the MOE and other expenses of government are concerned. And about 180 billion from smuggling. Total all of these and you could construct X number of schools, X number of streets, X number of um, hospitals and other potential social services that the government can and should be able to afford if only good curb, if not minimize or totally eradicate corruption. Sorry for the answer. Yeah, but as a senator, how are you going to solve these problems? You can only legislate. As a senator, as a member of Congress, you can only legislate. Um, I'm of the firm belief. Naka remain sa mga problema natin, hindi na bagong batas ang kailangan. One of, um, one, of, uh, one, of uh, one of my colleagues in Congress um, has this anecdote that he always um, tells us. When he first ran for Congress, he did not file a single bill while he was a member of Congress for three years. When he was seeking re-election, um, his constituency asked him, Bakit ka namin bumoto ulit? Ni isang bill wala kang pinay. Mambabatas ka ba man din? Ang sagot niya, simple lang, pero masakit. So sabi niya, Kaya naman, huwag niyo akong hanapan ng batas. Sampung batas lang ang binigay sa inyo ng Diyos, hindi niyo pa sinusunod. Bakit ko pa dadagdagan? Ay kung sinusunod natin yung sampung utos ng Diyos, sabihin niyo nga sa akin kung may problema tayo. Huwag na yung sampu, mahirap na yung morya niya, hindi ko rin kabisado. Yung dalawa na lang. Nung dumating si Jesus, ginawa niyang dalawa. Um, respect and love thy father and um, your fellow man as much as yourself. Um, kung mahal mo kapwa mo, pag nanakawan mo ba, dadayahin mo ba, lulukohin mo ba, sasaktan mo ba, o gagawa ka na anumang masama sa kanya. I'm of the firm belief that hindi bagong batas ang kailangan ng solusyon natin. As a member of the Senate, as a member of Congress, um, we should all promise our people simple things. One, that we will bring their voice and their vote in the Senate insofar as, uh, um, insofar as issues brought forth before the Senate is concerned. And secondly, that we will exercise our powers to ensure that all of the laws that have been passed thus far are indeed implemented and followed to the letter by those who are supposed to implement them and by those who are supposed to follow them. Dalawa lang ang gawin natin sa ating bansa. Sundin ang batas at ipatupad ang batas. Maraming papabago tayong makikita sa ating bansa. The way or the mode I'm referring to is the um, power of Congress of oversight and to conduct congressional inquiries in order to check on abuses of the executive. Aren't these powers in the aid of legislation? Isn't that the primary focus? Not necessarily. There are two functions of Congress. One is oversight function to ensure that the laws we have passed are indeed followed to the letter. And number two, if they cannot be followed to the letter, then we should find out what the reason is, if at all there is a need to um, amend or pass a corrective piece of legislation. But if not, it's simply calling the attention of the executive branch to follow the letter and intent of the law that Congress has passed previously. Uh, and our next question has to do with uh, call centers. You know, most <laughs> graduates, even of top schools, you know, they end up working as call center agents. Is this something you would support, or would you sort of promote entrepreneurship as an alternative way? Um, we should promote local entrepreneurs. We should be able to give them enough incentives in so far as being able to conduct and have their own business. Um, um, uh, concentrate on indigenous talent and local talent or local products or local raw materials. You call center is a temporary temporary phenomenon para sa akin. Wala namang masama, pero hindi rin naman tama na on the long term, ayan na lang tayaan at asahan natin. Take for example, forward-looking countries like Singapore. I do not and cannot see why our country cannot do the same in so far as planning forward, planning or being forward-looking is concerned. Five, ten years ago, Yung mga Chinese at Korean nationals at Indian nationals nagpupunta rito para mag-aral ng English. As of today, ini-import na lang nila yung mga English teacher papuntang Korea, papuntang China, papuntang um, India para turuan yung kababayan nila mag-ingles. We suffered a double whammy in so far as that is concerned. We lost out on what we may call student dollars, yung mga gusto sana matuto ng English dito, at yung kababayan natin na layo pa sa kanyang mahal sa buhay at yung kinikita niyang sweldo doon, doon din yung siyempre ginagastos yung bahagi. 
we should be able to be forward-looking enough and not simply react to the current situation. We are in a position, given our placement in various com various countries in the world, to be able to um, predict or somewhat um, plan ahead in so far as the career path of our citizenry is concerned. Another example. In na yung mga ambassador at consul natin, nagiging alalay at tour guide ng mga congressman, senador, sekretaryo, mga asawa nila o anak o kapatid. Ang dapat saan nila gawin trabaho? Alamin ko anong nangyayari na gaganap sa bansa niyon. Halimbawa, sa aking pagkakaalam sa Dubai, may ko-construct na hospital doon o kinoconstruct na matatapos sa year 2011. Alam nila kung anong klaseng skilled labor ang kailangan, alam nila kung anong klaseng medical personnel ang kailangan, at alam din nila kung ilan. Bakit hindi natin i-train at alamin natin yung mga pangailangan? At pag napunuan na natin yun, tama na rin. In Australia, that's how they do things. They look at the career path and available professionals in the country. And whenever they find out that a particular career is being filled up, they simply communicate with the schools by increasing the quota, meaning yung average grade quota requirement for a particular course, or limiting the number of students that can take that particular course in order to redirect and direct their graduates according to the needs of their country or according to the needs of the market. Hindi natin ginagawa yun, wala tayong ginagawa kaong na yun, pero kaya-kaya gawin natin yun. I think that's what government should do. Hi, Kaya. Hi, sir. Sir, for this campaign, how much do you intend to spend? It depends on how much money we can raise. Um, we work on a weekly basis. Um, we plan for one week and depending on the amount of money that we can raise for a given week, we adjust accordingly. Um, I was interviewed once and I was asked how much money I had in a bank and that was as truthful as I could get. Um, of course, the interview word did not ask me how much money I had. She asked me how much money I had in the bank. And I said 200000 um, I'm of the firm belief in what Kevin Costner said in the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have thus far tried to build our campaign, build our name, build our plans, ambitions, and dreams for the country in the hope that um, the support will come. But in so far as studies are concerned, the administration bets are correct. To be able to run a credible campaign, you need about 100 to 120 million pesos to run a credible campaign. Kami, nangarap kaming ma-raise yung pondo yun, pero kung hindi man, we are willing to adjust accordingly and make us the necessary changes with respect to our strategy. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, when you last ran for a political, uh, for an elective post, how much did you spend? Um, by far, more than hindi kami umabot sa maximum spending requirement, um, limitations provided for by law. Under the law, you can only spend three pesos for every um, registered uh, registered voter. Under the law, a party can only spend five pesos for every registered voter, cumulative. In Sarsagon, we only have approximately 180,000 registered voters times three. So that's approximately a little less than one. A little less than one. And we comply with the requirements of the law in so far as expenditure is concerned. Uh, sir, given the cost of campaigning and the lack of immediate impact <coughs> legislation has on running a country, why run for senator? Why not mayor or governor or again a representative of Sir Can't run for rep anymore, Sir Sagan. I finished three consecutive terms. Um, another relative of mine is running for a local position. The last thing I want would be an Escudero, 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 Escudero um, line up for local positions. Thirdly, I don't think this is what I will be doing for the rest of my life. I would want to run for a higher position and find out, and I would be lucky enough to find out at age 37, if this is still what I will be doing. I have had the perspective of my district, um, in so far as serving government is concerned, would want to broaden that perspective if I will be given the chance. If I would not be given that trust and chance by our people, then I guess it's time to move on in other fields and so far as my professional career is concerned outside of politics, outside of government, where perhaps life might be easier and happier. Sir, um, yeah, are there friends who have pledged already the nations? Yes, yun ang pinakamadaling gawin sa mundo, mga ako. Ang pinakamahirap mangyari, ito pa rin yung mga ako. Um, friends have pledged to help, some have actually helped. And we have somehow been able to make do um, this past week. 
this first thing that I've said. For those who already help you, sir, don't you think you would be beholden to them in the future? I mean, someday they would ask for a favor. There's a basic distinction, and I draw the line there. If you ask for help and come and knocking at their doors begging, and they actually help you, then probably you are correct. But if you simply sit um, and sit still and not move, and um, wait for people to offer help and um, volunteer their own help, whether it be financially or in kind, that's where the distinction lies. Yan hindi ka nila hawak. Yan hindi pwede ka sumanggit. Kahit naman sa akin ngayon eh. Even if you look at it from the point of view of um, a person that you ask help from, you would be doing him a service, you would be doing his, his or her children a service, you would be doing the country a service, if you still did what you thought was right, instead of simply doing what they want you to do, even if, it's, even if it was against your conscience, your belief system, and um, your principles. I have been in politics for nine years. Wala pa na kapilit sa aking gumawa na isang bagay na hindi ko gusto o hindi ako naniniwala. Um, marami na rin tentasyon duman, pero um, nalampasan ko yun. At sana sa mga darating pantaon, malampasan ko pa rin at magkaroon pa rin ako ng mat matibay na paniniwala at lakas na sabihin pa rin no pag no. At yes, go, yes. Sir, another topic. What are your views on political dynasties? I am a beneficiary of um, a political dynasty and there can be no doubt with respect to that. My father used to be the member of the representative of the first district of Sir Sagon. He was appointed Secretary of Agriculture in 96. And I ran for the same position, the same district, um, in 1998. So you have to take with a grain of salt whatever it is I will be saying. Um, I am against political dynasties. <laughs> Thank you.